introduction chapters one through three of the origins of christianity by thomas whittaker this librivox recording is in the public domain introduction the origins of christianity chapter one biblical criticism and its verification critical analysis of the hebrew scriptures has resolved them for the most part into a stratification of pseudepigraphic documents this is a general character not only of the religious literature of the east but also of the incipient stages of our western literature we even find something like it in the scientific and philosophical textbooks of later classical antiquity though here the character is that of straightforward compilation there is no false ascription of authorship to saints and sages of old times it must therefore always be remembered that in applying the ancient and modern european norm of individual authorship to an oriental religious literature we are more likely to be wrong than right the koran which undoubtedly proceeded from a known person mohammed is an exceptional case among the books that have been made the foundation of the eastern religions that is of all the great historic religions although the new testament was written in greek at a time long after individual authorship had become the norm in greek literature it clearly belongs to the oriental type its ideas spring directly out of an oriental religion and the literature that immediately preceded it in its own line that is the later jewish apocryphal literature with messianic aspirations is admitted to be entirely pseudepigraphic it is worth noting that religious or semi-religious literature in the west also has tended to this type take the case of the orphic poems and of a large part of the compositions put forth by the neo-pythagorean school the cultivated greek mind however was critical in our sense of the term it really cared to know whether a composition was by its alleged author not merely whether it was edifying hence while modern criticism has been able to go further ancient criticism had already detected the true character of much of this literature when iamblichus writing in so credulous an age as the fourth century of our era apologized for what some thought deception on the part of the neo-pythagoreans the state of the case was evidently well known and his apology was exactly that of some modern europeans who have found it a merit in eastern authors not to make so much of their individuality as we do not to put forward any personal claim for their thought he argued that the procedure was to be commended as a sign of modesty if we could be perfectly impartial no doubt we should neither praise nor blame but simply recognize that it is a mode of authorship normal in a different intellectual environment when a literature which has arisen in this way has become the basis of a great religion especially of a religion still accepted in our time and country the difficulties of the critic are of course increased more stringent proof of the pseudepigraphic character of moses is required than of orpheus the opponent of destructive criticism can hold to the formal possibility that the writings may belong to the time supposed even if the weight of the inductive evidence is against it he can safely challenge the critic to produce the original manuscripts of the superimposed documents it is evident that verification cannot be sought along this line what then is the true method of verification that which must at length carry general conviction if scientific culture does not relapse to a lower stage it is no other than the historical or inverse deductive method formulated by comte and mill 
a generalization is made inductively from the facts of history then it is deduced by showing how the sequence of events was necessitated according to known laws of human nature in the special case of biblical criticism a certain chronological order of books and portions of books different from that traditionally assigned is inferred from analysis linguistic and other this order and the sequence of historical facts derived from it is then shown to make the process of history naturally or rationally intelligible as the traditional account does not by a method of which this is fundamentally the character a conviction of the truth of what is called the higher criticism so far as it relates to the old testament has already been brought home to most of the minds that can be got to attend to it the more ingenious and obstinate traditionalists say to the higher critics but you beg the question you assume the absolute uniformity of nature you will not allow any explanation that is not from natural causes we on the other hand believe in supernatural interferences with the course of nature now we defy you to disprove a miracle by formal logic till you can reduce us to self-contradiction we hold to the tradition of the religion in which we have been brought up and as you see we can do this without abandoning the use of reasoning to insist that we must admit everywhere iron laws of nature is out of scientific prejudice to refuse us the right to prove our case even if there should be actual exceptions to natural law to this the reply is that of course scientific method assumes the uniformity of nature but that it does not absolutely exclude proof of miracles if they occurred suppose that in certain regions of time and space the assumption of uniformity now and then led us astray that we ran against empirical facts which reduced it to nonsense at certain points then we should have to reconsider the question of its universal validity suppose for example that a priesthood affirms certain events not naturally explicable and that we meet with specific confirmations of them which stand out from the mass of facts we can explain let us put the case that to reason from natural knowledge has led to manifest error about the formation of the earth or the events of egyptian history whereas an account declared to be supernaturally revealed is supported by unexpected discoveries and enables us to think the order of events with logical coherence provided we dismiss the scientific prejudice in favor of uniformity this would oblige us to reconsider our position or at any rate to search for unknown laws but how different in the case in question is the real state of affairs to point to the issue of the conflict between the quasi-scientific assertions in cosmology in geology in ancient history to which theologians have committed themselves and the unbroken career of science almost savors of a past age how a religion basing itself from the beginning on such assertions can live without them is not yet revealed but we are to understand that the church no longer insists upon anything that can by any possibility come into conflict with verified science and we are to forget that it ever did we need not further trouble ourselves about apologetics grounded on an imaginary claim to have given a verifiable account of the universe in fact critical science has made just as triumphant progress as physical science the postulate that the history of the jews like that of other races is rationally explicable by natural causes 
has led to constantly increased insight from spinoza in the seventeenth century to wellhausen in the nineteenth the movement has been comparable to any other scientific movement that can be named spinoza was successful in breaking down the supernaturalist assumptions by analysis but he did not put forth a constructive theory which could give permanent satisfaction he took the idea of the hebrew commonwealth too statically reasoning as if a society fundamentally of the same type had existed all along modern criticism at length found the true solution in placing the realization of the type so far as it ever was realized at the end and explaining it by development under special circumstances from a primordial state of things that was far less determinate those who redacted their sacred books during that late stage of the national life which we call the theocracy drew back their ideal into the past ascribed the final legislative code to a supposed early lawgiver moses to whom the law had been divinely revealed and with a view to edification attributed all the errors and misfortunes of the people to deviation from the imaginary revealed code placed at the beginning in this process however the late redactors did not wholly rewrite the earlier records on which they worked portions of the oldest hebrew literature lie embedded as fragments with a newer structure around them this mode of composition carried on sometimes for a considerable length of time has led to the existence of historical books not merely of two but of many strata each new stratum involving modifications in the history according as the kind of edification aimed at varied from period to period the more or less archaic fragments the words of which had been preserved to a certain extent unmodified as already sacred gave valuable clues to criticism which could thus disentangle the extremely complex structure and within limits explain the process by which it arrived at the form in which it was fixed this being the character of the old testament as literature and history we should expect similar phenomena in the case of the new testament which is its direct descendant and a little later critics are arriving at an equally thoroughgoing rejection of the tradition under which it has long been presented what seems probable is that we shall find the teaching ascribed to the founder of the new religion and his apostles to be a result of gradual growth thrown back in imagination to the beginning like the ideal of the ancient theocracy the question is will this hypothesis rationally explain the phenomena of stratification detected in the books by analysis for undoubtedly the books do present such phenomena they are not unitary compositions like those of a greek or roman historian or even romancer it will help to clear up the problem if we return to the history of the hebrews and try to set forth in brief outline some general results of criticism two the church state of judea the jewish theocracy as it is called that is the direction of life by a priesthood speaking in the name of god and appealing to sacred books was established under the persian supremacy many years after the chiefs of the nation had been exiled to babylonia on the conquest of judea by nebuchadnezzar the exiles who in the meantime had come in contact with the civilization of the new babylonian empire must have been considerably influenced by it continuous as it was with the immensely long tradition represented by the assyrian and old babylonian monarchies it stood for a far more elaborate system of life and thought than their own the extent of the obligation has been partly made out by recent discoveries 
but it is yet too early for definitive results to be stated when the babylonian dominion had given place to that of the kings of persia certain priestly reformers inheriting the ideals of the prophetic movement that had preceded the exile and had gained some transitory political successes in judea were allowed to rebuild the temple of the national god and to remodel the nation as a church from this and the following period dates not only the redaction of all the sacred literature but the original composition of a great part of it if the attempt is made to trace the history of the hebrews before this time the condition of the documents puts many difficulties in the way but it is historically certain that from the ninth century b c they had been divided into two kingdoms the northern kingdom of israel and the southern kingdom of judah the former was overthrown by the assyrian power near the end of the eighth century the latter had survived to the beginning of the sixth an undivided kingdom of israel described as having existed earlier had probably been ruled in succession by the two biblical kings david and solomon the accounts of them however are much embellished and this portion of the record has not yet been confirmed by the monuments of the great empires then existing it has been conjectured that about the twelfth century b c the israelites formed part of a group of desert tribes making incursions on the cultivated land of canaan these tribes having conquered territories for themselves took to a settled life and by degrees formed the nationalities we know as israel edom moab and ammon anything earlier than this is legendary or altogether mythical on the borders between palestine and egypt semitic tribes the kindred of the israelites were from time to time subject to the egyptian government but there is nothing whatever to confirm the story with which we are familiar of the captivity of israel in egypt and the exodus under moses when we go back to abraham isaac and jacob and the twelve patriarchs we find ourselves in a region of mythical figures turned to literary account perhaps of old semitic gods brought down to mortality the effective beginnings of the literature scarcely date from an earlier period than the ninth century from this period come the most archaic portions of the early books the israelites were originally polytheists like the surrounding tribes but like the others they had their own tribal god the god of israel was at first worshipped with rites like those of semitic heathenism generally he was represented sometimes by an image in the form of a man or of an ox under the name of the king molech he was propitiated in times of national calamity by rites of human sacrifice as was also shemosh the god of the kindred moabites and the carthaginian deity whom the greeks called chronos among the hebrews however there arose in the eighth century the reformers described as prophets they claimed to speak in the name of jehovah as the god of israel has long been called in european literature denounced many immoral and inhuman cults as contrary to his will and more especially aimed at the extirpation of idolatry that is the representation of jehovah by any kind of image he was pre-eminently a jealous god who would endure no other divinities beside him intolerance of other worships was for the israelite a sacred duty of the kings who had not rigorously practised it but had allowed foreign cults in their dominions altogether they might worship jehovah first it was said later that they did evil in the sight of the lord the higher minds among the prophets succeeded at length how early or how late it is difficult to say in arriving at an ethical monotheism 
jehovah was the god of the universe there was no other god he rewarded righteousness and punished iniquity he asked not for sacrifice this conception it should be needless to point out was never realized in the public religion the actual achievement of the prophets was by forming an alliance with the priests of jerusalem to centralize the worship to put down irregular local cults and to get rid of graven images by the returning exiles from the sixth to the fifth century b c the national monarchy having disappeared the state was identified with the congregation of the lord pure theocracy was henceforth the ideal a most elaborate system of sacrifice and ceremonial observance was established and was declared in the name of moses to be for all time jehovah was identified as the higher prophets had identified him with the god of the universe but he remained essentially an invisible king to be recognized by the state demanding at the hands of his chosen people a perpetual service of bloodshed and burnt offering nevertheless an interest in questions of moral conduct went on apart from the sacrificial cult there it was proposed to solve by application of the law there arose what has been called a system of legal dialectic the characteristic jewish institution of the synagogue appeared in the rabbinic schools there seems to have been relative freedom of moral and religious life analogous to that of protestantism the reforming movement with its stress on the inward disposition had not been in vain private judgment could be used in interpreting the sacred texts the hierarchy did not grow into an anti-human organization for the repression of thought the conception of heresy had not yet been evolved an elaborate cult was still unaccompanied by an elaborate creed the deepest questions about human destiny might be put freely and unshrinking discussion of them was admitted in books that came to be regarded as sacred as time went on the priestly families displayed tendencies to the type of a secular aristocracy among their members were afterwards the sceptical sadducees when judea through the fall of the persian empire came under the dominion of the greek kings of syria it needed a national uprising to prevent the hierarchs themselves rather than the foreign king from hellenizing their religion and institutions the contest was fought out in the second century b c between the ideals of a polished decadence and of exclusive theocracy and the latter triumphed under the maccabees national independence was won though only to be lost again as the dissolution of alexander's world empire made way for the advance of rome meanwhile the distinctive line of spiritual life which the nation had marked out for itself was followed to new issues three post-biblical eschatology of the jews a famous work of the maccabean age marks the transition to a new epoch the book of daniel was written to encourage the pious jews in their resistance to the hellenizing movement started from within but taken in hand with violent caprice by the seleucid king antiochus epiphanes the composition was attributed to the seer daniel a supposed jewish exile in babylon four hundred years before the date of the book much in it that purports to be prophecy is therefore an account of past events in symbolical form it became the model of all later apocalypses both for jews and christians pseudo daniel was not received into the number of the jewish prophetic books but only into the class of writings known as hagiographa the earliest critic to detect its real character was the philosopher porphyry in his extensive work against the christians known to us now only by the references of ecclesiastical writers 
renan has described the book of daniel as a first attempt at a philosophy of history the jews he remarks were in a central position among the great empires acted as intermediaries and could observe their transformations from an external point of view thus they were prepared to see a general direction of the world movement and to search for its law the later apocalypses with all their supernatural machinery have something of the same wide outlook the law of history according to daniel is clearly the successive dissolution of the kingdoms of this world to give place at last to the universal theocracy foretold by the prophets and the dream was in a manner fulfilled though not by the jews not to their advantage and not with the idyllic effect anticipated in some of the prophecies when their kingdom of god came it brought not peace but a sword there are indeed prophecies with the tone of which this was quite in unison but in many there prevails the hope that the nations will at length feel the attraction of the pure religion revealed to israel and will voluntarily submit themselves to its ordinances israel is conceived as having for destiny to be a priesthood for the human race and efforts were made in both directions while peaceful proselytism was constantly going on there was no scruple about making war on neighboring peoples in a religious interest during the time of jewish independence the heathen inhabitants of galilee were subjected and converted to the temple worship by force what in general was looked for however was a catastrophic change brought to pass without human volition as part of the design of god with the world in the later period the kingdom of god on earth was usually conceived as established by the messiah the anointed king a figure derived from various passages in the prophets and not of wholly consistent attributes among the current imaginations were those of a messiah ben david who was to be triumphant and of a messiah ben joseph who was to suffer occasionally also in the apocalyptic writers there is no deputed king or messiah at all god rules directly traces of an anti-monarchical theocratic feeling like that of the puritans as we may learn from the canonical books themselves were not unknown to the jews the suffering messiah combined the ideas of the just man struggling with adversity and of the holy people persecuted by the heathen for adherence to the one true god both these modes of suffering had forced themselves as facts on the jewish mind and had contributed to modify the prevalent ideas on the destiny of the soul which apart from external influences seems to have undergone changes curiously parallel with those that went forward in a similarly spontaneous manner in greece as is well known there is in the great period of hebrew literature and religion practically nothing that has reference to personal immortality the prophetic writers hold that the problem of divine justice finds its complete solution in earthly life national or individual it is not that they had consciously dismissed that animism which is man's first conception of the source of individual life and thought in the archaic portions of the bible there is sufficient evidence that the hebrews were not exceptional in their early ideas they too had the notion of the soul as a kind of breath or shadow they had their sheol for departed souls as the greeks had their hades the religious reform of the prophets however was not specially concerned with this jehovah was the god not of the dead but of the living like the olympian gods of greece ideals of righteousness were to be realized and to find their justification on earth there is no reason to suppose however 
that the notion of a permanent individuality or even of its manifestation as a ghost ever disappeared from the popular mind just as in greece this played a larger part in the general religion that could be inferred from homer or sophocles so no doubt in judea it went on unaffected by the silence of the prophetic literature thus when the theodicy of the prophets under stress of the facts of israel's destiny was felt to have broken down religious thinkers were able to recur to the animistic idea in order to redress the balance by visions of a future life though the parallel with greece does not altogether fail in this last stage yet the differences are more conspicuous than the resemblances in judea there was a far more decided influence of what we should call the practical religion ethical aspirations did not indeed suggest the thought of survival it was already there but they were the motives that set thinkers to work on the problem and the small part that metaphysics played in the process is seen in the form which the expectation of survival usually took namely that of a resurrection of the body in the jewish apocalyptic literature the future bodily resurrection of the dead was associated with the coming of the messiah when the predicted deliverer has established the kingdom overthrowing all who resist him among the nations the dead will rise again and join the faithful israelites who are alive at his coming it is not inconsistent with this which is the general imagination that the messianic kingdom should be pictured as enduring on earth that kingdom is of course the theocracy universalized jerusalem is its centre and all enemies are put under the feet of its anointed king in the resurrection sometimes only the righteous have part sometimes the wicked also are raised up to be punished along with the living enemies of the messiah by some visionaries the fate of the heathen at the resurrection is passed over in silence by others they are included as a matter of course among the wicked the agent of punishment sometimes of destruction is the fire of gehenna though of different origin as imagery it corresponds in conception with the tartarus which through a mixture of ethical ideas with the primitive more indeterminate notion of the future had come to be regarded by the greeks and romans as a place of retribution for crimes that had escaped judgment in this life we have now evidently reached a state of the spiritual atmosphere which explains much in the gospel but there are still some further preliminaries end of introduction chapters one through three